you've been asking and now you will receive. My take on the Snapmaker U1 Budget Tool Changer 3D Printer. Multicolor, multi-material and tool changer 3D printing seems to have become a real focus of the channel with my Prusa XL Endeavors and SV08 tool changer build. But now we've got a new contender, the U1 from Snapmaker, who previously made 3D printers that converted to CNC and laser. This one is just a 3D printer, but it is priced very competitively compared to alternatives. The Snapmaker U1 recently finished on Kickstarter, and I know plenty of people wanted me to cover it before that campaign ended, but I didn't have the printer until after that time. You can still pre-order it on the Snapmaker website, so let's have a quick overview of the printer. Our main feature is that we have a tool changer with four different tool heads. Each has their own nozzle, so that means we don't have purging like on Bamboo Lab AMS systems. And Bamboo Lab is a good comparison, as Snapmaker have built up their own ecosystem, including an app, a built-in camera with print monitoring, and a whole raft of sensors for automatic calibration and error control. One point of difference to Bamboo Lab printers is that the firmware is open source because it's running Clipper. And besides their proprietary app, the Slicer is also open source, supporting both vanilla Orca Slicer as well as their own branded version called Snapmaker Orca, and we will compare the two later on. Another key aspect is the build volume at 270 millimeters cubed. And finally, one of the main selling points of this machine is its price point. The pre-order being 850 US dollars and the regular price being 1000 US dollars, which is much cheaper than its closest competitor, the Prusa XL with the five tool assembled version coming in at $4,600. Although to be fair, we have to mention that the build volume on the XL is much larger and it does have an extra tool head. Before we go on, three very important things. Firstly, I have not had this printer long enough to call this video a review. We can still learn a lot, but it's not detailed enough for that. Nevertheless, I've still followed my review policy, which means you receive complete transparency. This printer is not available publicly yet, so you might have guessed it's been sent to me free of charge by Snapmaker to test, and there's no affiliate links down below in the description. And finally, the hardware may be final, but I've been told that the Slicer, App and Wiki final versions are still a few weeks away. So with that in mind, let's continue testing. Let's start with the usual unboxing, setup and calibration. And this printer was well packaged, arriving in good condition without any damage. The printer itself is mostly assembled, so much of your time in setup will come from peeling off protective tape and removing cardboard and foam. We have two main boxes that house spare parts and accessories. The narrow one on top has four 500 gram rolls of PLA filament as well as the power cord for your region. And then underneath, deep in the belly of the machine, we have a larger box that contains a toolkit and some spares, a twin set of filament feeders and four filament spool holders. Packaged within foam safely beneath that are the four individual tools that we need to install. To guide us in this process are two booklets, the first being a safety guide that is actually more about the specifications, with the section for each language only being two to three pages long and many languages included. We then have the hard copy quick start guide. This is full color and it was a joy to use. It was well written and edited, the diagrams were really clear, with helpful annotations and every step that was explained was clear to me. All of the tools required for assembly and operation are included, which makes life easy as well. Like many 3D printers these days, we have some injection molded sacrificial pieces included just to prevent damage in shipping. We also have some screws temporarily holding the bed to the base so it can't move around. Once all of these are out, we have access to the final bits of foam and tape and can start the assembly. First up are our filament feeders and there's one for each side, each having their own individual ribbon cable loom. Once connected, these simply slot into position and have a locking tab to prevent them coming undone. We have two PTFE tubes per side, connecting from these feeders up into the underside of the docks, and then we install the four spool holders by clipping them into place from the side. Inside the printer, we install a clear bucket that collects any filament wiping waste, which brings us up to installing the tools, but let's have a closer look first. We have a magnetically attached panel on the back. This gives full access to the hot end, we have a little window on the side where we can see the extruder gear, and then we have a yellow lever that is not a filament cutter, but rather a way to take the pressure off the extruder for manual feeding. We have three locating features, and then we can see inside the sliding lock that holds the tool in place. This is quite similar to the locking system on the XL, except smaller and fully contained within the tool. 
This next section was the trickiest, but still pretty easy. We slide the latch into the correct position and then feed it onto the pin before sliding the tool sideways, which toggles the latch and interfaces with the magnets on the dock to hold the tool in place. It should be noted that the first tool is mirrored compared to the other three and it has a sticker to identify it as such. As you can see, it moves to the left of the dock, whereas all of the other tools move to the right to meet their holding magnets. We now have a slightly more unusual step where we loosen two screws inside the shuttle, move the carriage around in a clockwise path, and then re-tighten those two screws. The reason is not explained, but my guess is this relates to belt tension. Each tool is connected via a bespoke USB-C cable. On the frame side, this is coupled with a PTFE tube guide, and two bolts hold the assembly in place. The other end of each cable then goes into the top of the tool, and this time we have two self-tapping screws to make sure it doesn't become disconnected. At this stage, the cables are a tangled mess, so some oversized PTFE tubes are used to not only guide the filament, but act as an umbilical. There's three clips per tool that hold the two together, and so far, this combination has provided sufficient structure while still being flexible during movement. That completes the assembly, and this took me somewhere between half an hour to 45 minutes, and I would say the majority of people will finish in under an hour. The printer can then be turned on, and we proceed continuing setup on the touchscreen. Some aspects are mandatory, such as selecting your language and region, as well as accepting some fine print. You're also prompted to connect to your local network, yet this is optional, as is making an account and logging in via QR code with the app, which we'll discuss later. Next up are the initial calibrations, and all up these take around half an hour. The vast majority of this is completely automated, but we do need to intervene from time to time, such as cleaning each nozzle one at a time with the included brush, removing the bed in one phase, so each tool head could auto calibrate its offsets. This is done on a pressure sensor, cleverly packaged into the bed. The bed then goes back in to finish the calibrations, including a large mesh being taken for auto bed leveling, automatic input shaping tuning, and remember, it's clipper under the hood, so this is the same procedure using an accelerometer as you might have used before. I think most people will be up and running between 90 minutes and two hours, which sounds like a lot, but it is a lot quicker and easier than the equivalent Prusa XL setup. The final part of the setup is to load filament and print a four color demonstration dragon that uses all of the tools. Because this is intended to be the first print, there's still instructions guiding a new user through. There's a chance to override or confirm the mapping of the colors for each filament, and then finally, the user can select from the last set of options and commence their first demonstration print. But for me, I had some problems that needed fixing first. My calibration sequence had initially failed because the printer failed to stow tool 4 back on its dock. I fixed this and ran the calibration a second time, which fortunately then completed. But at the start of the print, this error came up once again and was becoming more frequent. I also had a second error related to tool 4 where the filament wouldn't load, and frustratingly, even if I removed the PTFE tube and fed the filament through enough that it was actually coming out the nozzle, the printer refused to acknowledge its presence. So initially, all of my test prints were done with the first three tools only until I could get technical help. I was instructed to disassemble tool 4 and I found inside that the signal wire for the filament runout sensor had been severed. Certainly not ideal for a production unit, but this was at least an easy fix with a bit of solder and heat shrink. I assume regular customers would be sent a replacement cable. As for the parking issue, after I provided video, it was determined that the coordinates were off for tool 4. To correct this, I was guided through a procedure to find the correct X position for tool 4. And this was actually quite simple. I just needed to home the machine and manually move the shuttle to make sure the pin was aligned with the hole. It's definitely hard to see in this photo, but it turns out that the default position was about a millimeter off in my case. After using more manual movements to make sure that the new docking position was reliable and repeatable, I saved the new X coordinate to the printer's config and the problem was solved. Since then, I haven't had any failures for any of the tools for docking or undocking, whether it be doing it manually or mid-print. One thing I'd like to showcase that I really like about this printer is the filament handling, and that's because that this filament feeder on the side is actually motorized, similar to an AMS light. As you feed in the filament, it will automatically be driven through the PTFE tube, stopping just shy of the tool. On the touchscreen, we can then come to load mode, select the tool that we want to load up, and press the button for an automated sequence. This includes feeding the filament into the top of the tool, extruding enough to purge any old filament, and then cleaning the nozzle and cooling everything down. Unloading filament is much the same. We go to unload mode, 
select the filament that we want to remove, where again, an automated process will remove the filament from the end of the tool. So now we can simply remove the spool from the side and pull out the excess filament. The whole system works really well and I'd recommend using it rather than manually loading because the one time I did that, the filament was in enough to trigger the runout sensor but not enough to actually engage and I wasted a few hours printing this. As for compatibility, as is becoming common, if you load filament from the ecosystem, in this case Stampmaker, it will be automatically detected, but you can use your own filament and enter on the touchscreen exactly what it is, including the color. Let's move on to software and firmware, starting with the printer's UI. And we know clippers underneath the hood, but all of this appears to be custom to suit the aesthetic of the machine. I don't have any complaints here, I could access every function I needed to, and I found it intuitive and easy to use. Firmware updates can be done over the air, and the presence of that local update button suggests that maybe they can be also done from a USB flash drive. Assuming the printer's on our local network, we can enter the IP address in our browser to get the Fluid Clipper interface. And as we established, this is not the final version, and I assume they will clean up some of the excessive macros, including macros to change up to 32 tools. This really does operate like any other Clipper install. We can access the console, manage the jobs that are loaded to the machine, see the input shaping graphs from the automatic calibration, and open and read all of the printer's configuration files. There's also an advanced mode accessible from the touchscreen that removes the read-only aspect for editing. Currently, there's also no way to display the webcam in this interface. However, I understand that is in progress. That brings us onto the app, which is in beta and not publicly yet released. The first tab has different articles to read. The service tab has links to the wiki and allows you to lodge a support ticket. But most importantly, the device tab will give you all of the controls that the touchscreen offers for your printer, and it will also let you turn on the live webcam feed, although the frame rate for this is not exactly great. Not ideal, but still good enough to check in on a print to make sure that it's progressing without any issues. I did experience a one-off bug where it thought the printer was offline even though it was actually printing. Fortunately, a restart fixed this problem. Now let's compare the two slices. Vanilla Orca Slicer, where you can simply add the Snapmaker U1 on the current release, and Snapmaker's custom fork called Snapmaker Orca, which you can download now as a nightly build from their GitHub. Comparing the two is actually pretty interesting because each has pros and cons. In the vanilla version of Orca Slicer, we can simply add the printer's IP address and treat it like any other clipper printer. That means when we switch to the device tab, we get the normal fluid interface. There's no way to sync the filaments loaded into the machine, so you'll have to set that manually. And assuming you got that right, you can simply upload and print and the print will start immediately without any checks. Alternatively, you can do an upload but not print and then start the job from the touchscreen so you can confirm which filaments are loaded up and you can set other options like time lapse as well. In Snapmaker Orca, we still don't have a button to sync the filament, so again you'll have to do that manually, but the big difference is when we switch to the device tab. Here, like the app, you'll find all of the same controls that the touchscreen offers, including the webcam feed. And after you've sliced and selected upload and print, you'll be given the same confirmation as the touchscreen where you can double check your filament allocations and turn on things like time lapse. One thing that I found quite amusing is that Vanilla Orca Slicer had not only a lot more presets for print quality with over a dozen compared to only three, but also a lot more support for various filaments with 10 versus only seven for Snapmaker Orca. The final thing to discuss is the support and the wiki, which even at this early stage is looking very powerful with many, many step-by-step -step illustrated guides on how to check and repair various things. This proved quite invaluable for me as I was sorting both my issues for Tool 4. And a shout out to Snapmaker Tech Deco, who helped me through that process and asked for my feedback on some of the documents that aren't yet final so they can be the best version of themselves when they appear on the wiki. The interface on the touchscreen is already very good. I just hope that in future, the firmware is updated to have QR codes for any error messages that point to that great wiki. Shall we see how it's printing so far? All of the models you're about to see are linked below in the description. The majority of the printing that I did was multicolor PLA to stress test the tool changes as much as possible. And after I recalibrated the position for tool four, I didn't have any other failures. Firstly, that pre-sliced baby dragon, and this one turned out quite well. The only blemishes I would complain about are some very minor wisps of stringing on the back of the body. Apart from that, it's glossy, detailed, and generally high quality. The first print I actually completed was this DSE calibration model, and it showed me that the offset calibration for tools 1 and 2 was spot on. This articulated armadillo I recently printed on the Prusa XL and the Bamboo Lab H2D, and this is a good version of it, with all of the parts articulating as they should be, and clear separation between the colors. 
Again, there's a few tiny wisps to be pulled off by hand. This Dice Tavern is a model I previously printed on Excel. I used automatic supports, which added a bit more than I anticipated, and some of it was hard to pick out of the details in the windows. Beyond that, again, it's pretty clean. A few wisps here and there, so good, but room for improvement with a little bit of slicer tuning for the final release. These boxing gloves are a great torture test for multicolor because they require quite a lot of support material, including on the underside of the model. That means there's a lot going on with the various tools mixing colors. Again, another clean print with minimal blemishes that I would hope are ironed out in the final version of the firmware and slicer configuration. My final PLA print was this bronze Mandalorian bust, which I think looks fantastic, again, apart from some fine wisps and little blemishes. Let me repeat, these are very easy to remove with your fingers, they're not really embedded in the model, but it would be nice to have the filament profiles tuned just a little bit more, so the zero post-processing required. Dropping the nozzle temps by 5 degrees or so would probably do the trick. The included PEI bed was great for PLA, but struggled a little with other filaments. For instance, these small PETG parts for the SV-08 were knocked loose pretty quickly, but stuck just fine on another printer with an aftermarket bed. This bed size is a little unique, so if you want a third-party bed for the U1, you're going to have to be patient. This larger SV-08 part in PETG was able to get enough grip to stay attached. The dimensional accuracy was there for inserting all of the bushings and magnets, but we can see some VFAs on the side wall. Perhaps with tuning, there's a sweet spot for feed rate where these can be minimized. I've only done just enough TPU printing to know that the extruder doesn't jam and that for small objects, they don't stick to the bed very well. Although retrying with some hairspray did get this print over the line. Ignore the stringing here, this is really old and wet TPU. I also ran a quick multi-material test, printing this main object in PETG, but printing the support layer in PLA for easy peeling. As you can see, this works quite well, because PETG and PLA just refuse to stick to one another. And because of that, just a little bit more tuning is required to slow down the extrusion above the interface layer and achieve a cleaner underside. That should be an easy fix for a very useful capability. If you're interested in nylon, ABS, ASA, any filament that warps, you're going to be out of luck because the top of the printer is open, which means you're going to need a custom enclosure. Just quickly, there might not be any nozzle purging, but each print that uses more than one tool will still need a purge block, which means there is still some waste. Let's finish by talking about privacy and open source, and there is a LAN mode for those looking to avoid the cloud. This severed the cloud connection as expected, but in vanilla Orca Slicer, the device tab still worked great. The only real thing needed here is the webcam feed, which is hopefully coming. For those who want to be completely offline, we do have a USB port on the back of the printer, and any prints exported from Orca Slicer and loaded from here will still get the exact same options, like confirming filament choice and turning on things like time lapse. The slicer is open source and the source code has been published to Snapmaker's GitHub. But we know that under the hood we're running open source Clipper. And at this stage I can't see anywhere where they've published their changes and I'll be applying whatever pressure I can to try and convince them to. In summary, to me this feels like a slightly larger and more open source tool changer version of a Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon. And I think at this price point that is going to be a very attractive package for many people. I will keep testing this printer to find any weaknesses. And in a future video, I'm going to do a big tool changer comparison, comparing head to head the Prusa XL, the SV08, this Snapmaker U1, and the Bamboo Lab H2C. Manufacturers have suddenly shifted their focus to multi material printing, so let's try and find out which solution is the best one for you. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.